Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. And now please welcome Sarah Simmons of CityGrid. Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Simmons and I'm the founder of CityGrid, which is a culinary salon in Olita. And many people ask what a culinary salon is. It's a term that we made up to describe what we're doing because I have a restaurant that doesn't operate like a typical restaurant. We, um, we host dining events and food culture events and I cook half of the time and the rest of the time we bring in chefs from all over the country, really with a focus on bringing in the next wave of up and coming chefs. So the rule is if you're super famous that you can't cook at City Grit unless you bring two chefs with you that no one's heard of or that isn't well known because we really want that model of like, the opening acts for the headliner because getting exposure to New York diners and New York food media can change the game for you. And you guys, being a chef is a really hard life. I've realized this. And so anything that we can do to help these amazing up and coming chefs get a leg up is um, we've done our job giving back. Um, so a little bit about me. I um, am a product of having been given a leg up. And so that's why it's important for me to try to do the same for others. I was a retail strategist, um, started off my career as a trend spotter in the tech world. After the first dot-com fallout, I thought to myself, I need to have a more solid job. I'm going to assign myself to something that has a revenue number attached to it, and I'm going to be in retail. And so I worked for a number of retailers um, as a consultant and then went out to work for Pokemon to run the retail division outside of Japan for a couple years. Um, I got to travel a lot, eat in a lot of amazing places, and I didn't get to see my friends. So every other weekend, I would invite my friends over to my house and make dishes that had, I'd, or they were inspired by dishes that I'd had on the road. And so it started to become a thing. You know, 10 friends would come, and then two weeks later, eight of those people would come, and they would, someone would bring another person, and then they would become a friend. And then, so it became more of a supper club. and. Um, it was good fortune that Food & Wine Magazine was having a contest looking for the nation's best home cook. And a lot of my friends are super bloggers and early adopters and had Flickr accounts stacked full of pictures of food that I'd made. So it was really easy to submit a lot of content um, and get the support of my friends to talk about my food and my passion for cooking on the food and wine community. So as a result, I was named the nation's best home cook and it opened a ton of doors for me. And so I was sent on this amazing trip with five of the uh, world's best chefs, Eric Repair and Grant Ackett and Jose Andres. And I was taking six months off to do research on a book that I was writing about the future of retail and these chefs when we would talk about it, would say, you talk about retail and it seems like you like it, but you should be doing something in food because that's what you love. And so I thought, okay, I'll do something in food. So it took me a good year to figure out what that something was gonna be. And really City Grid is the product of that year. It was traveling around the country, meeting with a bunch of chefs. Every chef that I met that didn't live in New York would say, oh my God, I wanna cook in New York one day but the options are really limited. It's either cooking at the James Beard House, which is invitation only, or a friend that has a restaurant has to shut their kitchen down for the night, um, which is really disruptive to the flow of the restaurant. And so I thought, selfishly, I want a restaurant where I don't have to cook the same food every day, and I don't have to cook every day. So I'm going to cook most of the nights and then two or three times bring in guest chefs. And really that's where the concept of City Grit was born. And now it's turned out that it's, it's more than just the guest chef program, but it's less about me and my food and more about really bringing attention to these up and coming chefs. Um, so a little bit about City Grit as a whole. Um, we have five revenue streams. In the beginning, I, I started City Grit with only $25,000 of outside money because I'd never run a restaurant and I barely worked in a restaurant. I'd, 
begged Michael Anthony at Gramercy Tavern to let me work for free in his kitchen, just so I could see and learn. And um, so who was gonna give me money? I, I wouldn't give me money. Um, and I met with someone and they said, you just have so many what ifs. You, not only do you not have this experience, you, no one's done this, so there's no model to, to replicate. And so um, I said, I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is and I'm going to um, just see what this first year brings. And it was hard. I mean, the $25,000 was gone in the first four weeks because we were open, but no one knew we existed. And um, we really leaned on our friends and digital channels and got our friends to advocate for us and spread the word through Twitter and Facebook and um, we forward our newsletter to every person you know. Um, and it worked, it, people started coming, but it still was slower than, than we thought, like the getting the, the business off the ground. Um, so we had to rely on other things. So the core of the business is my dinners, which here's an example of something that I, I cooked this week actually. My friend Francis Lamb is a food writer and um, he's, he's a great storyteller. And he did some work post Katrina in Biloxi and he met these amazing people that are really the core of food in Biloxi. And so he came and he had collected oral histories from them and he came to talk about these people. And when I think Biloxi, I think African Americans and Caucasians and everyone he talked about was, they were Vietnamese and French and Croatian. They had these amazing stories about how they got there and what they were doing. And so with each story he told, I created a dish that was inspired by one of these stories. And then here you see an example, this is Ford Fry. He, um, he's a really special chef. He, his restaurant that he opened last year was named the best restaurant in America by Esquire. And he is opening a restaurant in the spring called Duke and King, that, or King and Duke, that is bringing cooking back to colonial times, which I think is interesting compared to what you were saying is that he's built this 24 foot wood burning oven in the center of the restaurant where every single thing is cooked <coughs> from it. So the meats are roasting and then they're dripping on top of the vegetables for flavor. And, and it's just something that everyone's trying to create foams and you know, hydrocolloids. And like, this is like going back to like what is ancient form of cooking. So he is coming to do um, a preview of his menu. But in the beginning, before we got the guest chef program off the ground and before people knew who we were and what we were doing, we had to find another way to um, bring in revenue. And so what was great about it is that um, we found, I was using private dining to subsidize the lack of income coming in from the guest chef program and from my dinners. And I realized that there was a huge demand in New York City for a private dining space from 25 people to 40 people. And so we just really tapped into our friends online and our tech friends that you know, threw private dinners or had lawyers that threw private dinners. And we started to book these dinners, which now is a, a core part of our business and subsidizes some of these programs that enable us to offer the top of the line food for half the price that you would pay at a normal restaurant for it. So we're serving the best ingredients and from some of the best chefs in the world and um, you're not paying, it's on a $150, $350, $250 tasting menu. Um, something that I didn't realize until it happened last year, we opened in September and in December, um, I didn't realize that no one was gonna come eat at City Grit. No one's gonna come do these weird dinners and or come to a guest chef dinner because the holiday parties, like there was too many, there's too much competition. And so we almost went out of business before we'd really even gotten off the ground. And so I, for four days, I cooked everything I knew to cook that someone would eat or buy during the holidays. And we turned our dining space into a store and we just sold so much stuff. Like literally people were buying Chex Mix. Like, I mean, in my head, I was like, that is, you're paying like $10 for four ounces of cereal but they were paying for it and they were excited about it and they were putting baskets together and um, we made enough money to get us into January when we really were rolling out the like, guest chef program for the second version of it. Um, and then this year, so I knew to plan ahead, we did $12,000 in gift basket sales. Food Network used it as their corporate basket. We were able, we donated $5 from each basket to the Red Hook Initiative and um, every part, everything we got from catering as well, we had 10% of that donated to the Red Hook Initiative. So it, it was 
a really, the, the experience that I'd had in December that almost crushed me, that was really painful previous year, was enabled me to really make smarter decisions this year. Um, and then we have a strong catering program. And catering is so not glamorous, but it also is very profitable and, um, and just enables us, again, to do more creative things that are more accessible to a, um, a bunch of people. Um, so how have we done this? I think a lot of it has been through our friends and Twitter and the media. We've gotten a lot of great press. This is something I'm really proud of because a lot of amazing chefs and food writers have been, and they're now customers, and they're writing about us and supporting us. And post Sandy, we, again, almost closed. We made our first profit in October and then lost $34,000 because of what I now call that whore Sandy. Um, and so <laughs> I, um, I thought, like, I'm tired. I don't think I can do this. And so, but we did it. We. Um, we survived, we've recouped 26,000 of that $34,000 that we lost in five weeks, which we think, I, I mean, I think is pretty huge. Um, but it was something bigger that made me, that gave me the energy to recoup this loss. It was, one of my friends said, if you can't quit. You have all of these chefs that are coming in January and there's people that are out of kitchens for months. So you need to help them. Like your platform is, a, it's a great place for, to help them. And so it gave me a bigger reason than myself to kind of buck up and start really hitting the pavement. And so now we have chefs that are coming in that are using the kitchen to make products that, you know, their kitchens were destroyed in Red Hook. And we've raised over $30,000 for the Mayor's Fund for Sandy Relief. And by the end of the year, our goal is to raise at least $100,000. And we're giving these chefs that are, like I have a friend who has, needs a popsicle machine and they're $12,000 and um, she lost three of them. So she's doing a dinner and she's keeping the profit. So we're really, I'm really proud of those things that we're doing. Um, other things that I think are exciting is that we opened a restaurant that you can't count on for that chicken dish or that pasta. The menu has never been the same. I've never served the same dishes. We have chefs that no one's heard of coming in. So what we were pleasantly surprised at is that we have so many people that are coming back. We have 40% of our guests have been twice, 20% three or more times. We have, I think it's 19 or 20 guests that have been more than five times and a handful of people. This one girl comes alone because her friends don't like food and she's been over 20 times. Um, <laughs> her, I don't know, they just don't. They're not willing to pay for to sit and eat things that they don't choose. I mean, I think that's the risk is that we're you don't get a choice. You're coming. It's five courses, six courses. You don't get to choose what you eat. Um, the newsletter. So having been, you know, giving digital marketing strategy advice to a lot of retailers, I always harped on the newsletter being important because statistically it showed that. But really, thought to myself, I mean, I delete like 30 things every single morning that are in my inbox that I never read. So um, I think that that is something that was exciting, that it's not just that people read it, but when the copy isn't good enough, they write us and tell us about it. And so <laughs> people aren't just in, in it for the food, they're in it for the, some sort of entertainment. Um, so anyway, I've, I'm just really excited. I hope that you guys can come visit us. And um, I think that's it. Any questions? <laughs>